In your Bibles tonight, 2 Samuel chapter number 2. 2 Samuel chapter number 2. And we come to David's life and Saul's dead. God has anointed him long ago to be the next king of the nation of Israel. I say long ago, but an interesting uh, tidbit of information. At this moment in David's life, Saul is dead. He's been running from Saul for 10 years. How old is David? 30. 30. So early in his teens, he was uh, conquering giants. and Or in his teens, he was conquering giants and leading troops into battle and pleasing the Lord and I'm reminded that uh, what the scripture says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Let the Lord use you. At the stage of life you're in, he wants to. And David, as a young man, is called of God to serve him. And the path that David is called to take is not one that's easy, right? You look at David's life and it's uh, overwhelming sometimes to think of the heartache that the boy had to suffer. But God is moving in his life and using him. And God is going to bless him. When I get this point in my thinking in the life of David, I almost want to think Saul's dead and David can go, Oh, <laughs> that ain't so. David's not able at this moment in his life or any moment in his life to just say, ha, I got this. I don't need to seek the Lord anymore. I don't need to fight the good fight. I don't need to bear the burden. We had a preacher's fellowship here last Tuesday, and I was so encouraged to hear the veterans, I asked the old guys to preach. I didn't call them old guys when they were here, but if they hear this, I don't care if they. I asked the old guys to preach because the young guys need to hear from the old guys. And uh, Brother Les Ketron got up to preach, and he's a blessing. And he said, I remember thinking that when I got old, it'd be easier. He said, but it's not. And you could listen to that and hear that and be discouraged by it or you could have the spirit that we ought to have that it just acknowledges the fact that in every moment of our life we are in need of God. And in every day of our life we must seek the Lord and determine to do and know His will and submit to His leadership. It's not discouraging to me to know that Life is difficult when I understand that God is almighty. And in David's life this moment, I wish for him at moments, at times, but I'm not near as smart as God, and God knows that David doesn't need a situation where he just says, I've got this, I don't need God. We see what happens later in his life when he gets that mindset. He slips into immorality with Bathsheba. I've kicked back and forth what to call this message and my official title I guess is King David anointed and opposed but I guess my secondary unofficial title of this message is I just keep trusting my Lord because at this moment Saul is dead and in chapter number one David mourns Saul and oh how the mighty are fallen he rehearses the psalm that God puts in his heart about that moment. It's almost like when we get to chapter 2 that surely David gets to the place where finally he's the king. And he is. But that's not all. It's not like Saul's gone and this event has occurred and everything else is going to be because that's just not how it works. A lot of people live their lives in great disappointment because they think of some event that's going to transpire in the near future that will give them the relief that they need and they can live happily ever after. 
I'm confident you can live happily ever after, but it's not going to be the byproduct of something you get or something you do or something that happens in life. You can live happily ever after when you depend on the mercies of God every day. You know, some of us, we have these ideas that surely when I graduate from high school, oh, I will have accomplished that and it will all be smooth sailing from there on out. All you folks that graduated from high school, is that true? No, it isn't. Then we have this idea that, well, if I can graduate from college, then surely when I've completed the task of graduating from college, then everything else after that is going to be... Those of you who have graduated college, is that true? Give a mighty no, no. Then you think, oh, wow, if I could just get married, then it's all going to be easy from that point forward. And all the married said, people said, you've lost your ever-living mind. <laughs> Marriage is very good. But it's not very easy. It has great benefits and it's not, not easy. People with careers saying, if I can get to the next promotion, if I can only be the boss, then it'll just be smooth sailing. Those of you who have made it to the place where you're the boss. Is it easy up there? No. If I can have my own business, then it'll all be, whoo. Is it easy there? <laughs> no. We think, oh, if I can just retire. You know what you do? Huh? Everybody's laughing. When you retire, all you do is change your schedule. You change your schedule from going to work every day to going to the doctor every day. That's just what happens. <laughs> if I could just retire. Uh, and the day that Saul died in David's life was not the day that David was able just to sail into victory and glory off into the sunset all the liars that make movies and fairy tales are making just those movies and fairy tales because all of life, every moment of life, every season of life, until we breathe our last breath. If we're going to have what we need, is going to be determined by whether or not we submit to the will of the Lord God. Whether we trust in Him and seek Him. And this great event in Saul's and David's life it's no different than the ones we anticipate may just set us free. David had to keep trusting the Lord. King David was anointed and opposed. In this passage of Scripture, we see a transition. It's a transition time, so it's a little, I wouldn't say it's disjointed at all, but the stories are interesting. And some things I want to help you with and show you as we read chapter number 2 of 2 Samuel together. Let's see what the Bible says. It came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? He said, Unto Hebron. So David went up thither, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household. And they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were they that buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh-Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you. And I also will requit you this kindness because ye have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened and be ye valiant. valiant for your master Saul is dead. And also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. But Abner, 
the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanam, and made him king over Gilead, and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the, name, and the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And Abner the son of Ner and the servants of Ishbosheth the son of Saul went out from Mahanim to Gibeah, Gibeon. And Joab the son of Zeruiah and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool, the other on the other side of the pool, and Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. Then there arose and went over by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. Wherefore that place was called Helkath has. Surum, which is in Gibeon. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. And there were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab and Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. And Asahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following of him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner with the hinder end of the spear smote him under the fifth rib. That the spear came out behind him. And he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died stood still. Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner. And the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Ammi that lieth before Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on the top of an hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? And Joab said, As God liveth, Unless thou hast spoken surely, spoken surely then in the morning the people had gone up every one from following his brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more. Neither fought they any more. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through all Bithron. And they came to Mahanim, and Joab returned from following Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants nineteen men and Asahel. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that three hundred and threescore men died. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night and they came to Hebron at break of day. So we read here this chapter of Scripture, and I appreciate you allowing me to read God's Word to you. I'm determined that there's never a waste of time when I read the Bible. And when we read God's Word together, and I love reading the text and reading the Scripture, because really I want you to understand more of what the Bible has to say than what Cody has to say, because what the Bible has to say is eternal and inspired, and I love God's Word. 
When we come to the story, we see uh, the transition that David is going to begin, the process of becoming the king of all of Israel. Maybe, perhaps, just because you've not read the story in a while or never knew anyway, we often think that surely as soon as Saul is dead that David immediately becomes the king of all of Israel, but that's just not the case. We come to this passage of Scripture and David's process to become the rightful king of the nation of Israel, I should say the accepted king, he is the rightful king immediately. David's coming to be the accepted king of the nation of all of Israel takes seven and a half years. But soon after the death of Saul, David is anointed once again publicly, to be the king over the tribe of Judah. David has a trusted general, and uh, Joab is his name. This is the first time we meet up with Joab, but Joab will play a very important role in the rest of the story, the life of David. We'll see Joab in the near future carry the letter that seals the doom of Bathsheba's husband. Joab. And in this text, we have two kings and two generals, and they're going to fight. King David and his general, Joab. And then there is another man, another general named Abner. And Abner names as the new king of the rest of the nation of Israel, the 40-year-old son of King Saul. The 40-year-old son of King Saul, I'm looking for his name. I can't find it in my brain. Somebody tell me what his name is. I got it. Ishbosheth, right? Ishbosheth. Have you ever tried to find something in your brain you couldn't find it? It happened to me just now. Ishbosheth. So Ishbosheth is evidently the fourth son of Saul that didn't go to Fight. He may have been intentionally left behind in order that he could be the next king of Israel in opposition to God and God's plan and Saul's clear understanding to God's word. And so on one side you've got David and Joab. On the other side you have Ishbosheth and Abner. Abner's an interesting character. We've met Abner on many other occasions. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Let's begin our text here. There's five sections of this passage of Scripture that we're going to work on. And I want to remind you that King David was anointed but opposed. Do you know that all of our lives involve those two things? The will of God and the opposition of the flesh. The will of God and the opposition of the world. The will of God and the opposition of the devil himself. King David was anointed to do the work of God, but it would come with trouble and difficulty. And we'll begin in the first part here. David is anointed to be the next king. The Bible says in verse number 1 of chapter number 2, it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? He said, Unto Hebron. So David went up thither, and the two, his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite, and his men that were with him, David did bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. What happens? David begins his work. Now, don't be deceived into believing that all of a sudden David gets all the kingdom, because that's not how it goes. Do you know that our lives are a process? Our lives are a process. If we live in this false assumption that there comes a time when everything is perfect and great on this earth, we live lives that will be disappointed. David is anointed to be the king. David is called of God and promised of God. But I'll have you know there never comes a moment in David's life where he cannot stop trusting in the Lord. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. How many of you have met folks who live their entire life waiting on their inheritance? Sometimes they die before the inheritance ever comes. It's a sad state of affairs. How many of you have met folks who live their lives waiting on the moment when they win the lottery? 
Most of the time, the lottery never comes. We've got to learn from this. And if it does, how many stories have you heard of the lottery making someone's life perfect for the rest of their days? You see, David was anointed to be the king, but that did not mean that David could quit trusting. Number two, David's anointing turned into opposition. You know, anything worth having is worth fighting for, right? And anything worth having will be required to fight for. Will be required to fight for, there's no doubt about it. And so when we come to this passage of Scripture, the first thing we see, David's first act of business as the king, is someone comes by and reminds him of what the men of Jabesh Gilead had, Gilead had done. Do you remember the bodies of Jonathan and Saul and his other two brothers? Oh, they had mutilated their bodies. They had beheaded them and hung their bodies on the wall. But the men of Jabesh Gilead, in great courage and with great risk, went and removed the bodies of Saul and Jonathan these two brothers off that wall, they brought their bodies, they burned the decay off and buried their bones properly and respected these men. And David, being a man that honored and respected God's anointed King Saul, he said, I want to honor these men. The Bible says in verse number 4 that the men of, uh, they told David saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. David sent messengers unto the men, verse 5 of Jabesh Gilead, and sent them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you. And I also will requite you this kindness, because ye have done this thing. Therefore now, let your hands be strengthened. And be ye valiant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. Now, the first thing David does, David's doing a noble thing. He's like, all right, Lord, you've called me to Hebron. You've called me to be the king over the people of Judah. The people of Judah have agreed to this. And he begins his kingly duties. And the first thing David wants to do is something very noble. He hears about the men of Jabesh Gilead and their great courage and their kind treatment of Saul. And he says, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to honor the men of Jabesh Gilead. He calls up a meeting with the men of Jabesh Gilead. And he says, because you've showed such kindness to Saul, I'm going to show kindness to you. I want to bless you. This is a fascinating transition in the scripture. What's the next word in this text? Verse number 8. What's the first word? But. But. Now, David's wanting to do the right thing. But. The word but and the transition here makes me believe that Jabesh Gilead did not accept David's kind extension. They didn't accept David's call and request to become faithful servants of King David. But, the Bible says in verse 8, Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim and made him king over Gilead. Now, this is fascinating to me. Who made David king in Judah? I'll tell you, the people of Judah anointed him, but God made David king. Who made Ishbosheth king over the rest, the all of Israel? Abner. Folks, men can appoint whoever they want to, but God is king of kings and lord of lords. Men can exalt the men that they choose, but there's no man that can overcome or overrule God's choice, God's man, and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we go. They, Abner anoints Ishbosheth, not anoints him, but appoints him, Ishbosheth, to be the king, king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Verse number 10, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David, and the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. You see, David was anointed king, but secondly, he was opposed by Jabesh Gilead, opposed by Abner, and opposed by Ishbosheth. What do we do? When we're doing the right thing, but we face opposition. I don't know what we do, but I know what we should do. When you're attempting to do the right thing, but opposition comes, by the way, it always will. What do you do? Throw in the towel. What do you do? Quit. 
What do you do? Get bitter at God? No. When you're doing the right thing, you should anticipate the fact that the devil is going to hate it. The flesh is going to hate it. The world is going to hate it. And when you face adversity, you should keep on keeping on trusting the Lord because God's way is right. What did David do? When the people of Jabesh Gilead declined his generous request, he just kept on trusting the Lord. He kept seeking the Lord. He kept serving the Lord. What did he do when that rotten, good-for-nothing Abner stood up against him? There's some interesting things about Abner that I think are fascinating. Abner. Oh, Abner. Where do we meet Abner in 1 Samuel, in the story of David? I'll tell you. Abner had been serving faithfully at the side of Saul. It's an honorable thing that he did. But Abner was the kind of guy that David liked to pick at. The first time we see Abner, do you know where Abner is? Abner is helping King Saul. And the day that David kills Goliath, it's Abner that brings David into the presence of Saul. Abner. Do you remember that time when David and his men catch Saul and his men in a cave? And David cries out to one of Saul's leaders and says, You should be ashamed, Abner, because you did not protect your king. And I can't help but think that all along as we learn more and more about Abner, that Abner was a jealous, envious man. Abner now is opposing David. What did David do? In face of opposition, David just kept trusting the Lord. Now look, you're tempted. You say, I've tried to be good. I've tried to do the right thing. But it just doesn't seem to be working for me. I still have trouble. You just keep trusting the Lord. You'll be glad you did. You see, David was anointed. David was opposed. The next part of this passage of Scripture, we meet up with a civil war. There's an interesting event that takes place. And so David... Leading on one side and Ishbosheth on the other, their generals, Joab and Abner, decide to have a meeting. Let's look at it, verse number 12. The Bible says in verse number 12, And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanam to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David, went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon and they sat down the one on the one side of the pool the other on the other side of the pool and Abner said to Joab let the young men now arise and play before us and Joab said let them arise don't be fooled by that word play it's right it's the word of God but what were they doing I'll tell you what happened Joab and Abner, I don't know if they did this with the consent of their kings, but Joab and Abner decide to have a meeting. Let's settle this thing. And so Joab has 12 men of war. Abner has 12 men of war. And they decide to settle this thing. And they said, let's let the boys compete and see what happens. It would remind you of a scene like David and Goliath when Saul said, I'll tell you, when, the, when Goliath cried out, I'll tell you, if one of the Israelites can take me, then we'll all forfeit. And so we have this story. They say, let's rise. Let's let them play. Let's let them fight. The Bible says in verse 15, Then there arose and went over by number 12 of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David, twelve on twelve. And they called every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together, wherefore that place was called Helkath Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. What happened? The twelve fought the twelve. The first time I read this, I've got this mental picture of ring around the rosies. There's... 12, there's 24 guys. They've all got one by the head. and They all stick their swords in the same night. But this was not some type of dance. The picture that the Bible wants us to see is they fought. And the result of their battle, 12 of David's men and 12 of Ishbosheth's men, they all died right there. This competition did not prove to be the right thing in the right way. 
And the result is verse number 17. Look at the scripture says. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner, Abner was beaten. And the men of Israel before the servants of David. What happened? There was a great battle. It's a sad battle. You know why? It was a battle that never had to happen. You see, if Abner had just submitted to the will of God, it was crystal clear. Abner had been in meetings with Saul and knew the torture that Saul was in. Abner had heard and seen all the promises of God. Abner had been exposed to David and knew that David was a man after God's own heart. Abner was very clear on the fact that God's choice for the next king was David. Abner refused to surrender. He refused to submit. Do you know what happens when God's people refuse to surrender to God's will? It starts fights among the family of God. The saddest part about this fight and this battle that's going on is the fact that it was the children of Jacob fighting the children of Jacob and the nation of Israel fighting one another. Why? Why? Because of the pride of Abner. Because of the weakness of Ishbosheth. Because of the rebellion. We need to learn to submit to the Lord. David was submitting to the Lord and victory would be his. But all the mess when God's people fail to surrender, fail to live in unity, fail, strive together. Well, it's a picture of what happens in churches sometimes, right? When we fail to submit to the will of God, when we allow personalities or a burden for some type of power that's insignificant at best to drive us to yearn for the flesh, a civil war, it breaks out and David and David's men come out on top. The fourth part of this passage of Scripture, as we hurry, is Abner and Asahel. This is an interesting little story here. It's an interesting story. You see, Abner is acting in the flesh. When you act in the flesh, instead of trusting and leaning in the Lord, you end up causing great trouble. And here's somebody, the Abner is on is the enemy's side, right? Who's the bad guys in this story? I'll tell you, Ishbosheth and Abner. They're the bad guys. Who's the good guys? The good guys are on David's side with Joab. But here we meet in the fourth part of this passage of Scripture. A young man on the right side who lets his skills and abilities and his desire to do his own thing cause him to fall. Now let's just see it together. The Bible says in verse 18, and there were three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab and Abishai and Asahel. These are the nephews of David. And Asahel, he was as light of foot as a wild row. I like that description. You look at me and you think, that guy is definitely as light of foot as a wild row, right? <laughs> that would not be true. That means he's fast. Asahel was fast. God had made him fast. and He was not only fast, but he was also very determined. Look at what the Bible says in verse 19. Asahel pursued after Abner. You know what I imagine happened with Asahel? He got so mad at Abner. He said, I'm going to get him. Asahel pursued after Abner. Now, Abner, he was a skilled fighter, a man of war. He'd been with Saul for 10 years pursuing after David. And he had been fighting For the cause, for the nation of Israel for many years now. Asahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand nor to the left from following after Abner. He's going to run him down. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. Then Abner looking, looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, I am. I can't imagine exactly how this scene looks. But Asahel is finally caught up with Abner. And when he catches up with Abner, Asahel, Abner is making his way somewhere. And Asahel, I can just imagine this fast, fleet-footed young man is tapping on the back of Abner, this man of 
seasoned man of war. I'm going to whip you, boy. I'm going to whip you. And Abner turns around and says, Are you Asahel? And the Bible says, He answered, I am. Verse 21. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand to thy left and lay thee hold on one of the young men. He says, If you want to fight somebody, fight one of the young guys. Don't fight me. If you want to fight somebody, if you want to pick a fight with somebody, pick a fight with one of these other guys. Don't fight me. He says, lay thee hold on one of the young men and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. What's he do? He just keeps on picking. I'm going to wear you out, Abner. I'm going to wear you out. And Abner said again to Asahel, turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? Why should I kill you? He says, if I kill you, how then should I hold up my face to Joab, thy brother? He says, if I end up having to go over and try to be allies with Joab, how am I going to face Joab if I smite you to the ground, you little pipsqueak? Verse 23, Howbeit he, repu- he refused to turn. Wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of the spear, smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. What happened? It's a sad moment. A man who's determined in the power of the flesh to attempt to do the work of God. By the way, you can't do the work of God in the power of the flesh. And if you think somehow you can pick a fight with the devil and win, you're wrong. You're no match. It's a sad moment. I just imagine it like this. Abner's carrying his spear. and Asahel's called up to him and poke him in the back. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to fight you. Abner says... Are you Asahel? Asahel says, yes. He says, pick on somebody your own size. Pick one of these young guys. Fight them. Don't fight me. And Abner just keeps on going. Asahel says, I want you. I want you. And finally, Abner's had all he can stand with a spear in his hand. With a sharp end out the back, he goes, "Mm." and right through Asahel's fifth rib and out the back of that young man. And he falls to his death. It's a picture of the contrast of doing things the way David is determined to do things at this moment in his life. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. We must never stop seeking the Lord. You may be strong, you may be talented, but you need the Lord. And we learn we must just keep trusting the Lord. The Bible says that Asahel fell to the ground and as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died, they just stood still. When they got there, they said, that's fine, I've got to, I've got to stop pursuing, I've got to do this the right way. They learned from the fall of Asahel. To make a long story short, the passage continues with victory and a truce. Abner says, look, we've got to stop this mess. Joab agrees. They never fight again. But I'll tell you who won that day. The people who are trusting the Lord. The Bible gives us a glance at the scoreboard. Verse number 30. Joab returned from following Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants 19 men and Asahel. 19 men of David's fell to their death that day. 12 of them. We're in the initial fight, 12 on 12. And Asahel, 20 total. Eight, seven beside Asahel in the first 12. But, verse 31, the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men so that 300 and threescore men died. 360 died. Let me tell you something. It's a tragic thing. To try to do the Lord's work in the power of the flesh. It's a tragic thing to try to live life deceived into believing that somehow you can do it because of your might. That you can do it because of your past experience. That you can do it because you've reached a certain point. Abner's going to learn. Ishbosheth's going to learn. 
Asahel learned the hard way. But David teaches a great lesson. What's that lesson? You and I have to keep trusting the Lord. Just keep trusting him. Oh, he's going to make himself real to you. He's going to prove himself faithful. And when you're on the Lord's side, hallelujah. David, what did he do? He was anointed and opposed. But in the midst of opposition, he just kept trusting the Lord. Let's pray.